Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. We say this time of the year, and we see bumper stickers, and, and it has been said that He is the reason for the season. But I want to ask you a question this morning, and we're going to answer it. Why is He the reason for the season? What exactly did God have in mind when he put this whole thing together? And in one way it's, it's okay, but in another way it's, it's a little sad that we only seem to talk about the birth of Jesus at Christmas, and we only seem to talk about the resurrection at Resurrection Day, or what the world calls Easter. And we have these different times of the year and that's okay to a degree because God set aside feasts and festivals to commemorate certain things. Passover was to celebrate them coming out of slavery, out of Egypt. But I feel today that I'm, I'm supposed to kind of give you the backstory, Like what, what took place and what was the, the reason for all of this being put together. And I think we need to come to the understanding that in the beginning, God has al al always, always, always existed. That when the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, that doesn't mean in God's beginning. No, that's the beginning of what we are supposed to know. And we know that God created this universe that we're in. All of this space out here we call the heavens. But have you ever thought that possibly before God created the heavens and the earth and before he created the universe and before what the world calls the Big Bang or Big Boom or whatever, that there may have been a trillion other Big Bangs, that you can't go far enough back in time to find the beginning of God because God has, now follow me on this, God has no beginning. We do. We have a beginning. But God has no beginning. So what in the world is his purpose in creating mankind? What's the purpose? Well, we could say, and I've heard it said, the purpose of God is so that he could have fellowship with someone. Now, are we to think that this God who created trillions of stars, hundreds of thousands of galaxies, who knows how many worlds and universes before we can even think back that far, because he's always existed. Are we to believe that this God who can do all that is so lonely that he would need to create someone that he could fellowship with, now follow me on this, on almost an equal level. Are we to believe that? Well, if we believe the Bible, that's true. God wanted fellowship. Does God have fellowship with anyone else beyond the heaven? We don't know. We don't know the extent of God. We know from the Bible that there's an area beyond the heavens. God created the heavens and the earth, but there's an area beyond the heavens, and the Bible talks about it many times. Jesus, when he resurrected, went far above all the heavens. And there are several verses that tell us what's there. The glory of God is there. The manifested presence of God encapsulates this universe that we know. So this God wanted fellowship, but he wanted fellowship of a certain type. He wanted someone that was in a way equal with him. Now, we're not becoming gods. Don't anybody get me wrong. But he wants to communicate. So, he devises a plan to create a being 
called Adam, mankind, man. And this man is going to be clothed with his glory, which the glory is the manifested presence of God. This man is going to be clothed with the presence of God himself, and God is going to make a place for him, and then God's going to come and visit him and walk in the cool of the day and talk with him as a friend. Now, in the same way that you build a house before you move into it, God created everything. He created the entire backdrop for man. Before he created man and put him where he wanted him to be so he could fellowship with him, he created everything that man would need. So, in the beginning, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, after he did this, before verse 2 of the Bible, he created the heavens and the earth, and then he created some other beings. We call them angels, angelic hosts. He created these other beings and placed them in the heavens, and they had a purpose. Because keep in mind, God is creating everything as the backdrop for the ultimate creation, which will be mankind. Now, these angelic beings that he placed in the heavens, God gave them what God always gives his creation. He gr gave them free will. He gave them the choice to choose. They can choose to choose. They can make choices. He created them for two purposes. You'll find in the Bible, the angels were created for two purposes. One, to worship and obey God and be his messenger. And two, to do for man what man could not do for himself. They were created to minister for the saints. Now, when the angels were created, they didn't know what the saints were because the saints hadn't been created yet. In fact, there is a place in the Bible where one of the angels standing by when mankind was created, and he says to God, who is this man that you are mindful of him? Why, why are you thinking about him so much? The angels didn't know God's plan. Did you know God doesn't always tell us everything he's going to do? There are things that you are going to have in your future that God is going to bless you with that he hasn't told you about yet. He has just told you, hang on and enjoy the ride. I will bless you. And we need to fear not and receive that blessing. Well, the Bible tells us, and I can show you other scriptures and for the sake of time, I just can't go to all of them. But the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Elohim et Hashemim Haaretz. God created the heavens and the earth. And then verse 2 says, and the earth was formless and void. It was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the earth. Now, I can show you in Isaiah where God word says that he did not create the earth formless and void. It says he created a perfect. The, the two Hebrew words there are tohu vavohu that he, he uses. And in Isaiah it says he did not create the earth tohu. He didn't do that. So what does that mean? That means he created the earth, the heavens and the earth perfect. But before verse 2, the earth became formless and void. Well, what happened? Between verse 1 and verse 2, there was a civilization of angelic beings, and they came to and from the earth. The Bible talks about it in several places. There were kings, there were kingdoms, there were nations. 
But God had created in the heavens one angel. He was a cherub. He was an angel. He was a cherub. And he was created for the purpose of leading the other angels in praise and worship to God. And his name was Lucifer. The Bible says that pipes and timbrels were a part of him. He was created for that purpose. And he was beautiful. Oh my, was he beautiful. His description is just beyond compare. But somehow, because he had freedom of choice, somehow he decided that he was going to rise up, tells us this in Isaiah, that he was going to rise up and he was going to put his throne right next to God's throne on the sides of the north, and he was going to be like God. Well, here's a clue, Lucifer. God didn't create you to be like him. He created you and the other angels to minister for the ones who he would later create that he wanted to be like him. So, you know, <laughs> it's kind of like Jim. Jim's a runner, you know, and uh, I see on the Internet all the time how Jim's winning all these events. I mean, our church should be very well pleased he represents us because he's a winner, you know. But one thing about when you're running a race Watch the Olympics. You've got to stay in your own lane. You've got to stay in your own lane. Well, Lucifer didn't stay in his lane. He was a cherub. That's the way he was created. He was supposed to do what God wanted him to do, but he decided to rise up. And somehow, he was a prolific liar. And somehow, through his deception, he convinced one-third of the heavenly host to follow him. And they made the choice to do that. Now, Jesus said that this was not a good choice for Satan. Because Jesus said, I saw him fall from heaven like lightning, and he was cast down to the earth. Now, everybody has their theories. My theory is that this is why the earth is a little bit off its axis. That's, that's my theory. Uh, as a pilot, there is a difference between true north and magnetic north. There's a difference. They're not the same. And the earth is just a couple degrees or so off dead center. Well, I know that a few years ago down in Mexico, there was a, uh, a crater that they found, and they could only see this crater from way up in the air from the satellite because the crater was so many miles across and they researched to find out what made this crater and it came down to a, a, a solid space rock you know a meteorite or whatever but by the it was traveling fast but by the time it hit the earth it was about the size of a bowling ball and the thought in my mind was well how could something the size of a bowling ball make a crater that was miles and miles and miles across. And as I researched it, I began to realize that it's not the size of the boulder, the meteor that hits the earth, it's the velocity. It's how fast it's traveling. And I got to thinking about what Jesus said. He said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Well, that's 186,000 miles per second. You take a, a cherub hitting the earth like that, I, I think that might knock it off its axis. Just my, that's just my thinking, you know. So, uh, but Satan was cast down, and the earth became formless and void. Now, God still had his plan for man, because keep in mind, two-thirds of the heavenly angels stayed with God. So Satan was cast down, and he became, from, he changed from Lucifer to the devilish serpent. He became Satan. And his fallen angels became very demonic. But God continued with his plan. And so he put man in the garden, and 
woman, Adam and Eve. They were in the garden, and that's a great story. You need to read it. Eve was deceived. Adam sinned. And because of that, the glory, see, when God put them in the garden, they were covered with the glory of God. They had the presence of God in their covering. God would come down and, and he would fellowship with Adam because Adam literally had the presence of God covering him. It was his covering. But when Adam sinned, see, now keep in mind, Lucifer was in Eden in heaven, and when sin was found in him, when iniquity was found in him, and he was created perfect, by the way, but he made the choice to sin. When sin was found in him, he couldn't stay in Eden anymore. He was cast out. Likewise, when sin was found in Adam, he couldn't stay in Eden anymore, and he was cast out. And I have all the scriptures here that we could read today about how Adam was cast out. The garden, which the word paradise in the Hebrew and in the Greek means orchard or garden. So he was in the paradise of God on earth. He was cast out. Now here's the interesting thing. When he was cast out, he was cast out because... When he sinned, he lost his authority. Satan tricked him out of his authority. Now, Satan didn't trick him out of all the authority on the earth and in the heavens. No, no, no. Jesus had all overriding authority. But the authority that Adam had, Satan tricked him out of it. And because Adam sinned, God removed his glory, and Adam was naked. He didn't have the glory of God covering him. Now, it does, the Bible doesn't say he was nude. It says he was naked. He didn't have the covering. And God, I mean, they took fig leaves. They tried to cover themselves. It just didn't work. Okay, And you've got to get away from these Renaissance paintings of them trying to cover themselves with fig leaves. No, it was more than that. They tried to cover themselves completely. They had no covering. They were exposed. But God gave them a new covering. And that new covering is the covering that we have right now called skin. God covered Adam and Eve with skin. But they were separated and destined to die. And it looked like to Satan that he had messed up God's plan. But God, oh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you all these scriptures. Now, I'm going to tell you what. These scriptures I have, I'm backing everything up I have today with scripture. If you would like these scriptures, email me at larry at allison.org, and I will send you all the scriptures that back up everything we're talking about today. All right? But when Adam separated himself from God, the Bible tells us that God, in Ephesians, it tells us that God had something that no other being in the universe had, and he has foreknowledge, foreknowledge. In other words, he can see down through the corridors of time, and he knows what's going to happen. Now listen, he doesn't manipulate everything. He doesn't, he doesn't make you choose something. And I know this sounds complicated, but he can see down through time, and without taking away your freedom of choice, he has foreknowledge and knows what your choice is going to be. Without taking away your ability to choose. So God, looking down through the corridors of time, knew in his foreknowledge that Adam was going to separate himself. He knew what Lucifer was going to do. And so he devised a plan, and the Scripture says that this plan was devised. Now listen to this. Right out of the Bible. 
before the foundation of the world. So God, in his foreknowledge, put a plan together before he even created the world to save the world. So now we have the descendants of Adam, that's us, living on the earth, covered with skin, just like Adam. We've lost the glory of God. We're not walking in the glory of God. But God wants us to live once again with his glory. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. But we're living in flesh and blood bodies. So he devises a plan. Now, here's the thing. God has certain laws within himself. Since man, now follow me on this, since man gave up the glory, it was going to take a man to get it back. Why did Jesus have to come? He had to, a, a sinful man gave up the glory. A sinless man had to take it back. And no, not one on the face of the earth was a sinless man. So God, 2,000 years ago, God hovered over this teenage girl, hovered over her with his Holy Spirit, and supernaturally, by the Holy Spirit, placed his sperm inside of her, and she became pregnant, and the Holy Spirit was the Father. But there was an earthly mother. So he was born of God and born of man. But he came to the earth and he said this over and over and over again. He is the Son of God. But he said, I have come as the Son of Man. Why? Man. What's the word for man in the Old Testament? It's Adam. It's Adam. So, Jesus came as the second Adam. In my notes, which you're going to write and get, I have scripture that talks about how the first, by the first Adam, sin was brought into the world. But by the second Adam, sin was taken out. So, Jesus was born as the Son of Man, and he had a heavenly father. You know, if you want to find out who the father of a child is, what do they do? They, they check the blood of the child and the blood of the father. Jesus had his father's blood. It was an earthly blood, but it was his father's blood. It was a physically earthly, but it was his father. So when he said, our father, it was his father. When he talked about his father, it was his father. Joseph was his stepfather. So, Jesus was born, and he lived his life. And when he was 30 years old, let's, let's just read this one scripture here. I think we need to read this today. Uh, let's look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, and that's talking about before they came together sexually, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Wow, that's powerful. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. And mark that down. Angels can enter into your dream and appear to you. If it happened to Joseph, it can happen to you. You may say, well, I don't think it can happen to me. Well, then it won't. Because you're only going to receive what you can believe. You need to start believing for, that God will manifest himself to you in various ways. 
dreams and visions. All right? An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take you, Mary, your wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. That's powerful. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, as did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So now we have Jesus on the earth. The son of the living God, the seed of the living God, and the son of man. And he lived his life sinless. You know, there, there weren't any miracles recorded by Jesus until he was 30 years of age. When he was 30 years of age, something interesting happened. He was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, a voice came from heaven and said, This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And at that point, the miracles started working. I think that's a sign to us. You can be a believer, but until you receive the Holy Spirit, well, that's a whole other sermon. So Jesus was baptized at the age of 30, and then the devil began to figure out what's going on. And he came to Jesus and he said, he tempted Jesus. And he said, all this authority has been given to me. Well, he stole it. He said, all this authority has been given to me, and I can, I'll give it to you. Well, Jesus didn't let Satan give him the, the authority. But here's what Jesus did do. Jesus died for our sins. And God raised him up on the third day. And he said, he told his disciples then, he said, all authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. And then in Luke chapter 19, or Luke chapter 10, Jesus said, and I give you authority. He received back the authority and he gave it back to man. And he said, I give you authority over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you. Well, we need to know that. What, why did Jesus come to the earth? One of the things was to take back the authority that Adam had given away. To the sin that the first Adam brought into the world, the second Adam took it out of the world. Wow, I mean, this is powerful. He came to redeem us from the curse of the law. He came to reconcile us. You can read in Ephesians, he came to reconcile us back to God. <laughs> Wow. 2 Corinthians talks about how now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself. How did he do that? Paul wrote that. How did he do that? He did that by what Jesus had already done. It had already taken place when Paul wrote that. God loved us so much. Look at this. Let me read this scripture to you. 1 John 3, 8. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. Now, now, follow this. For this purpose, say that. For this purpose. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. You want to know why Jesus came to the earth? What's that verse say? Here's the reason. This is Scripture. Here's the reason the Son of God was manifested. Why? That he might destroy the works of the devil. Did Jesus accomplish that? Oh, yes, he did. Then why, why hasn't Satan just gone away? He's on death row right now. He can't go anywhere. His sentence, he will be executed. 
And the time and date has already been prophetically promised. We know when it's going to take place. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So what's, what's next? Well, this same Jesus that died for our sins, and on the third day God raised him from the dead, this same Jesus, he had his glorified body after his resurrection. What does that mean? He had a glorified body just like the body that he has planned for us. The Bible says when we become glorified that we will become like him. When do we receive our glorified body? When Jesus comes back to get us. When's he coming back to get us? I would say it is really, really close. You know, the Bible tells us about, once again, it's another sermon. But the Bible tells us about what's going to happen just before Jesus returns. And did you know there is not one thing left prophetically? Not one thing left prophetically at all. Not even a little thing that needs to take place before Jesus returns and snatches away the church. Some people say, well, I don't believe he's going to come and snatch us away. Well, the Bible says he is. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe Jesus died and rose again, do you believe that? Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive will be caught up with them. That's the way it's going to happen. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, now listen to this, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. That should be a comfort, that there's a day coming when Jesus is going to come back to get us, and we're going to be with him. Now, in another place, Paul talks about what happens when we're caught up into the air. He says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we're not all going to be dead when we're caught up. Some of us will still be alive, but we will all be changed. That takes me, I still think that's one of the greatest scriptures we should have hanging over in our nursery. Over in the nursery, we should have a big scripture that says, we shall not sleep, but we shall all be changed. So, then forever, we're with Jesus. We're clothed with the glory once again. The glory that Adam gave up and substituted for skin, ah, we're going to trade in our skin for glory and we'll forever be with him. So Jesus being born on the earth as the Son of God and as the Son of Man, this time that we're celebrating every year about this time of the year, we're celebrating that part of the plan where Jesus came back to redeem us. Oh, man, it, this is exciting. And the, the devil, he's a loser. Really, I mean, he, he's a loser. Actually, he's already lost. Can you call him a loster? I don't know if loster is a word. Oh, well, praise God. So we're going to stand up, and in victory, we're going to raise our hands, and we're going to say, Lord Jesus, thank you for sending your Son. Thank you for making a way for salvation for me. I receive it. I believe Jesus is your Son. I believe you raised him from the dead. And I receive him as my Lord and Savior. I will never deny that I'm a Christian. 
I will always confess it. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hallelujah.